in terms of stuff, deadlines on change of five to exam one, quiz assignments part two, deadline Friday, March 1st, exam two, quiz assignments part three, deadline April 5th, and exam three, exam four, quiz assignments part four, deadline of 26, end of day. Then the exam five, the exciting final cover all the stuff, deadlines on Wednesday, the finals week at five. And once again, uh, in terms of needing the final or not, once you've done four exams and all the quizzes and assignments you wish to do, then you can use the grade estimator to see if the final could do anything. And since the best four to five exams don't count, if you didn't do the final, it would just, it's already scored as a zero and would just remain dropped. I'll say more of this in the future. Next week, I got lots of meetings, two minutes right down. I put an announcement on Blackboard of all the time and stuff. And those are, those are places I have to be for committee stuff and administrative stuff. You know, I put them up there because they impact the class, not because they have anything to do with the class. Before heading on to more stuff, any stuff about previous stuff, or stuff to be, or stuff stuff that needs more stuff. Okay. So last time we are looking at persuasion using, using visual images. And as we saw, an image itself can be emotionally powerful, it could be manipulated, it could be deceptive. But by itself, it's not a claim or an argument. Because an image, strictly speaking, is not true or false. We do use those terms metaphorically, like a true image would be a, you know, a correct real one, a doctor, and a fake one would be computer generated or manipulated. But they're not true in the sense of being a true claim or a false claim. We looked at deliberate manipulation, which thanks to the power of Photoshop and various other programs, has become quite famous, and we can expect in the future even more radical things, as anticipated by science fiction, in which entire you know, scenes and scenarios are created digitally and put out there to deceive and mislead. Also, we saw that one common practice is to take images that are not altered, they're real pictures of real things, but change the captions. You know, examples are often used for political purposes, so, for example, a conspiracy theorist may take photos of people, you know, celebrating a you know, holiday in the Middle East, and then capture it as, you know, um, Muslim Americans celebrating 9-11, which, of course, is just a caption stuck under there. People can caption images with anything. Now, kind of the defense against these, if, if it matters, one useful thing that we can do, you know, News agencies and stuff have resources to check on this, but we all have the Google, and you can right-click on an image in Google, and it will search for the image, and it can go and find the originals. Another example of this is sometimes they'll put up pictures of someone who's protesting, and they'll have a sign, and they'll easily Photoshop out the space and put in some you know, horrible, ridiculous thing, and then distribute that around. And those get exposed kind of pretty easily. I find, you know, found to myself, you know, associates of mine posting crazy stuff on their Facebooks, and I'll go and check, and I'm like, no, here's the original, they're protesting, you know, genocide, they're not doing something crazy. Java. <laughs> okay. Next. Thing the computer will permit to do so. One thing that's very useful for creating a distorted impression is the use of camera angles. And this is surprisingly simple, simple but also quite effective. Now, here's how you can use this. You can use it in the most common ways to either make a small crowd look big or bigger, or make a large crowd look small. And here's a concrete example of how that can be done. Now, typically, the way crowds of people work is pretty consistent. If you have the point of interest here, concert, rally, speaker, whatever, you'll have a you know, dense packing of people here. Then, of course, you'll have a scattering of people you know, farther back. Now, if you have a big event with a big turnout, you can make it look small by doing the camera angle this way. So you catch, if you catch the tail end of the crowd, it will look small, just like a few people standing around. And pretty much every crowd, if you've ever been in the crowd, 
you know, when you look at it, there was usually you had a pack up front, and then people kind of spread out in the back. So you can make a big turnout, look small by taking the pictures at that angle. Now, if you've got a small crowd, and you want to make it look big, you just kind of do the opposite. You take the shot here of the pack crowd up front, and then it looks like there's a lot more people. So you can make the same, the same size turnout look either very large or very small, depending on how the camera is angled on things. And of course, there's various other techniques for using, using camera angles, uh, lighting, etc., to make things look you know, good or bad. Next. Similar to misleading captions, there's also a problem with lack of authority. Namely, you just get an image and people are making claims about it. You know, not capturing them, making claims about it. But you don't know who took it, where it came from, is it genuine? It's a common technique, you know, places like Facebook and Twitter, to take an image from somewhere else and you claim that it's a picture of, you know, something from other than that's occurring. In this case, it's not all captioned. People are just distributing the image, making claims about it. And again, things like news agencies have ways resources resource and check on this. But again, for us, you know, people don't have our own news agencies. Google provides that handy thing. It's not available, but you know, right click, you know, do an image search. And often, if something's a popular you know, image being misused, you can trace it back to the, the original. Because that's probably where the person that's using it got it from. Another problem are basically fake images. These are sometimes used to be funny, you know, non-sinister purposes, or to kind of troll people, or sometimes to, you know, for actual misuse. It can be from movies, models, uh, staged events, etc., and of course, utterly complete fabrications. Here have some examples. One example is uh, the TV show Lost. They're, of course, in the Spoiler, perhaps. Uh, it begins, of course, with a plane crash. You know, there's a part where the plane is being torn apart, people are flying out. And I remember getting, you know, emails from people like, oh, this terrible, terrible plane crash. Here's a shot of it. So I type back and oh, that's a TV show loss. That's that's not real. Planes do crash. Those are just actors. But of course it looks it looks convincing. And so if people I mean, it seem, may seem silly, but if people don't recognize TV shows or movies, stills of things like disasters, etc can be perceived as real, and then they make the rounds of the, of the internet. And again, kind of an easy fix is the handy Google search, or being aware of your you know, movies and TV shows, etc. There are also, of course, videos that are, are staged. Many things on um, YouTube that look you know, too good to be true, or a good example if they're doing kind of like a, a political thing that's supposedly capturing real people, and they have like multiple camera angles, and it's incredibly well filmed. You kind of wonder like, well, if you have like a shaky, you know, cell phone video, that kind of makes sense. But if you have a very stable multiple camera angles that switch between them all the time, you kind of think, well, they'd have to have like a camera here, 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 and how do people not notice all those, those cameras, those very stable cameras? And those are probably faked. I mean, not guaranteed. Maybe they're just really good at hiding their, their cell phones, but ones that look too good to be true often are stage. And again, they're often used for political agendas, uh, either on the left or the right. And of course, there are things that are just totally fake. So the takeaway here is basically this. There's a saying that seeing is believing, but of course that should not be true. If the image, if you have doubts about it and it matters, then these are things you should consider, especially again going forward into the future where Digital manipulation will be even more common than it is today. We should be extra careful about images. So it's something important, especially if it's something that, like, really you know matches your ideology, or your beliefs, or really upsets you, has a powerful impact. It's always good to check on that to ask, but is this actually real? Is this you know the correct caption? Is this being manipulated in some way? And so caution is always an important thing. Before pressing on away from images, can you think about this? 
I need some more stuff. Okay, so we've reached the end of chapter five, which brings us to our usual recap with unusually large faults. Now, as we saw, the main goal of rhetoric is persuasion. And the idea is to make people feel a certain way so they believe as you wish them to believe. And as we saw, this is all about a motive power, a motive force. Going back to my food analogy, rhetoric is like the seasoning, the flavoring of food. And it's presentation, like on the plate. And of course, from the standpoint of nutrition, those seasonings um, and positioning on the plate have no impact whatsoever. In the case of logic, logical force is what actually supports a claim that shows something is you know, probably true by providing support for it. Going back to the food analogy, the logical force is like the actual nutritional value, the calories, etc. And from the standpoint of assessing food as nutrition, that's the part that is of concern. Now going along with metaphor, if you have like good food, it would be foolish to not flavor it at all. Just eat, you know, just plain food, unseasoned, you know, just throw it in a, a bucket or something. Because it's perfectly fine to take stuff that is good reasoning and make it, metaphorically speaking, taste better. But you should always keep in mind that the flavoring of the logic has no effect on the logic. So taking a good argument and sprinkling on some rhetoric doesn't make it a better logical argument. Taking a crappy argument, sprinkling on some rhetoric, doesn't make it better. But from a practical standpoint, if you want people to, to listen, just like with food, if you want people to eat food, eat unless they're starving, you'd want it to taste good and look good. Likewise for arguments. If you're building an argument, there's no sense in making it look terrible, just like there's no sense in making a meal and making it look terrible and taste awful. But again, the flavoring has no effect on the logic. And a critical part of critical thinking is sorting out the flavor from the, the actual nutritional value. Now we went through many rhetorical devices. In terms of how this can be useful, on the side of evil, or maybe not evil, these are all useful tools when you need to persuade people. Typically for evil purposes, but not always. And we saw euphemisms, which is, of course, taking something neutral or bad and making it look good. Um, for example, instead of saying that we're in a country shooting people, we would say we have kinetic actions, which is the in phrase now for going places and shooting people, which sounds nicer and confusing. Dissimisms do the opposite, making the neutral or good look bad. And then we looked at the Weaslers, protecting claims by weakening them, downplayers, stereotypes, innuendo, loaded questions, hyperbole, rhetorical definitions and explanations, analogies, proof surrogates, and of course repetition, and of course repetition. In terms of how this stuff shows up on like exams and quizzes and stuff, uh, true-false questions, you know, using the definitions, likely thing. Also, since we get a bunch of these things, uh, multiple choice questions will be, um, for example, it might be, uh, the government describes military operations as kinetic actions. This is most likely A, euphemism, B, stereotype, C, innuendo, D, loaded question. In that case, it'd be euphemism. Now, on the side of good, the idea is to defend against these, to be aware of when they're being deployed and how to neutralize them. And typically, the main neutralization is to ask, but is this and particular cases have you know, individual methods you can use. So things like euphemisms and dismisms, you'd swap out neutral terms. So take the positive term, swap in a neutral. Or take out the negative term, swap in a neutral. Bless you. <clears throat> we now head to chapter six. Now, chapter five is all about rhetoric which again is like spices and flavoring and presentation of food, and it's nutritionally inert, it adds nothing. Now we turn to our first look at fallacies. Now, fallacies, as we'll see in the future in more detail, 
they are bad arguments. Interestingly, and sadly, they are much more effective at persuading people than good arguments, which is kind of weird. But to use an analogy, you can kind of think of fallacies as like junk food. You know, they have some nutrition, so they're food, but they're, you know, bad for you. But people, of course, generally prefer junk food over really healthy food. So if you, have, if you offer someone, you know, some broccoli and kale, or you offer them, like, um, ice cream, <laughs> they'll probably take the ice cream, because kale is not particularly delicious. Except for Tom Brady, apparently. He apparently really likes that stuff. So first thing we'll do is look at fallacies, and the first set of them will be ones that are all about emotions. So one way fallacies are used, where they get their power is, it's bad logic that triggers people's emotional responses. So the bad logic makes them feel, and so the logic is, is bad, but the feeling is strong. So people will accept or reject a claim based on the feeling. So the basic technique is, as we'll see, bad logic makes the, the target feel, Feeling that way, the target accepts the claim. For no logical reason, just because of the feels. Now, there are also ones that don't deal with emotion, but they deal with psychology as opposed to logic. And these get people to into a particular psychological state, and then they accept a claim, not because of the logic, but because of the psychology. <coughs> and we'll see how to use these on the side of evil and how to defend against them on the side of good. Now, the authors of the book coined a useful phrase called pseudo-reasoning. And of course, pseudo means... So it's kind of like a, it means not science or fake. Yeah, it's fake. You know, like, yeah, like pseudo-science. It's like not really science. Or like in biology, you know, snails have like pseudopods. They're like feet, but not really feet. So pseudo-reasoning is fake reasoning. It looks like reasoning, but it's not. To use another metaphor or analogy, you can think of fallacies as like counterfeit money. They look like money, but they're, they're fake. And just like fake money, they can trick people into accepting it as real. But of course, the reason you wouldn't want to accept a fallacy is the same reason you wouldn't want to accept fake money. Because essentially, think of the argument as like paying you for your belief, and if someone pays you in fake currency for something, you're getting ripped off. You're exchanging something of value for something valueless. Same with the fallacies. When someone's you know, getting you to believe something based on a fallacy, they're using counterfeit arguments. Now, there are some things to keep in mind. One is, even though we'll look at a bunch of fallacies, in theory, there's an infinite number of these. So we're not going to cover all of them. In fact, you know, the book only covers a very small amount. If you go on like Wikipedia or Amazon and do a search on books on fallacies, there are a um, hundred or more fallacies with names. And, but there are also theoretically an infinite number of fallacies. Secondly, not all things that look like fallacies are fallacies. We'll see when we go through these. There are things that look like the, the bad reasoning, but are not. And it could actually be good reason, or maybe no reasoning at all. Thirdly, the book doesn't include this, but kind of should. There's something called the fallacy fallacy. And that's when someone says, aha, they're using a fallacy, so the conclusion must be false. And that's not the case. To infer that a fallacy gives you a false conclusion would itself ironically be a fallacy. Because a fallacy doesn't mean the conclusion is false. The conclusion weirdly could be true. It just means the logic is bad. So a fallacy could, weirdly, everything in a fallacy could be true. Because a fallacy is not about is it true or not. The question is, is the logic good or not? So again, bizarrely, someone could be doing fallacies all day, and everything they say could be completely true. It just, the logic is bad. To use an analogy, it could be like someone just guessing. You know, they don't know how to do math, they're just like, just guessing at everything. And they just happen to get it right. It 
their reasoning is terrible, they just lucked out to get a right answer. So likewise, you get a terrible reasoning getting to a true, a true conclusion. Now the first type we'll look at are fallacies that are all about emotions. And kind of generically speaking, their kind of template is this. Step one, you present something to cause an emotion in the person, in the target. And as we'll see, you'll need, as always, to know your target. The more you know your target, the better you can trigger them to feel a certain way. So the more a person knows about the audience, the better they can be at making fallacies work. And this assumes they're doing it intentionally. Then the conclusion is that a claim is true. Now, laying out a bear like this, no one would ever fall for this. Like, if someone said to you, hey, here's some emotion, my claim is true, you would say, no, <laughs> that doesn't follow. So how do they work? Well, they work by basically making you feel, so then you accept the conclusion. So it's more subtle. But if you tear it down to the basics, it's clear why these are all bad logic. It's like, here's something, so you feel angry. So my claim is true. Well, that doesn't follow. But when people do it, you know, for the real fallacies, they make people feel the emotion, put up a claim, and they tend to, to fall for it. So one of the main defenses against these is digging away the emotions and getting to the actual structure. What are they actually giving? Now, some fallacies are intentional. The person knows what they're doing, and they're trying to manipulate their target with the fallacy. Some fallacies are accidental. The person sincerely believes what they're doing, they're just bad at, at logic. They're just making a mistake. There's no malice though, but they're still, they're still trying to lead you unintentionally through bad logic. And people can even inflict these on themselves. As we'll see, fallacies like wishful thinking are self-inflicted. They're ones that we do to ourselves. And of course, in those cases, we really don't know what we're doing yet, we're just you know, doing it's bad, bad logic. And so people use fallacies for three main reasons. One is intentional manipulation. The other is just bad, bad at doing logic. And the third one is, you know, self-inflicted. Just typically because, unless someone really hates themselves, probably just by, they're just bad at logic and you're falling into this way of thinking. And the defense again is, we'll see particular defenses, but the general defense is get it to the actual structure and you'll see that you're being offered, no, it's like a con job, where someone is like promising you, apparently promising you all this great stuff and doing all this, you know, bait and switch, et cetera, or whatever. But if you boil it down to what they're actually giving you, the answer is nothing. It's just a, a con. The first fallacy you look at is called the argument from outrage, also known as appeal to anger. One thing about fallacies is there's no like International Bureau of Fallacy Naming Regulation. So depending on which book you go to, or website, or Wikipedia entry, you'll see different names. Now over the centuries, there's been some attempt to kind of, kind of make them use the same name. But again, pretty much every logic book will have its own names for different fallacies. So this book calls it the Art of Outrage more commonly known, more broadly known, as appeal to, to anger. And again, there's no, in a way, there's really no like correct or official naming, because there is no International Bureau of Fallacy Naming and Standards, although maybe there, there should be. Now this fallacy rests, not surprisingly, on anger, a very powerful emotion. Now, anger has the effect of making people stupid. <laughs> for whatever reason. So not surprising, if you want to manipulate people, it's easier if people are being stupid. And so if you get people angry, they become stupid, and they become easier to manipulate. Which is why you always see dictators and demagogues, they're always trying to make people angry. You never hear a dictator or demagogue telling the audience, you know, now we must be calm and calmly reflect on this, unless they're being sarcastic. They're always trying to rile up the crowd, because they understand 
that stupid people, well, angry people become stupid people and become easy to manipulate. So people are angry, they don't think straight. Which is why you rarely hear of cases where someone says, there we were, calmly and rationally discussing it, and then a huge fight broke out. It's usually people being angry and then bad stuff happens. Now interestingly, even though anger makes people stupid, people get stupid in two very predictable ways, which enables people to manipulate anger by making people stupid to get them to act in very predictable ways. The first one is this. People tend to think when they're angry, because the anger is like shutting off their brain, at least the non-angry parts, they will tend to think they have a reason to be angry because they're angry. When all they've got is anger. So what a person will do is engage in kind of like a circular process. They'll think, I'm really angry, and there's going to be a reason why I'm angry, so it's got to be justified. So in a way, the fact they feel angry, they, they, they check, they're like, am I justified in my anger? Yeah, I feel angry, so I am. But all they're doing is seeing that they're, they're angry. So what they're really seeing is they're angry because they're angry. So one easy thing makes it easy to manipulate people this way is you get people mad, and they'll think they're justified in their anger. So they'll want to, they'll want to believe they won't be as critical or critical at all. Second, anger is like a virus. It spreads. So if you get people angry about one thing, the anger will spread to other things and affect those. So, for example, I'd like to give it an example of the argument from, from outrage. This is about an example of it spreading and also an example of the fallacy itself. Suppose um, there's a company where the employees vote on one of the bonuses for like the most, you know, the best employee, the most, you know, whatever. And suppose uh, two coworkers, uh, Sam and Dave, are talking, and Sam says, you know, even though I really like that money myself, Sally did a great job this year. Even though, you know, we've had all these tariffs and problems to deal with, she managed to work around them, final turn of markets, she really kept the company going, she totally deserves it. And suppose Dave, Dave says, you know, you remember last year at the Christmas party when she said she doesn't date coworkers when you asked her out? Well, guess who she's dating now? She's dating Billy, an accountant. How sad, how sad to be. And then Sam says, yeah, that's, I don't think she deserves it at all. And Dave says, you know, I'm in the running for it too. You could vote for me. Wink, wink, not nod. And so in that case, has Dave given Sam any logical reason why Sally doesn't deserve the award? No, the fact that she wouldn't go out with him is irrelevant to her, you know, her what she's done to the company. And even if she is dating Billy in accounting, even if that is true, that's irrelevant to whether she deserves it or not. But of course, what Dave hopes is that Sam will be angry, and then he'll become angry about the dating thing, and then it'll spread to something totally unrelated, namely her work qualifications. Now, this is something that affects um, all of us. Again, like workplace examples are you know, a pretty good example of this. A person may be mad at someone personally, nothing to do with their work, but of course, have you ever been in a situation yourself you know if someone's mad at you for personal things and you're at work, unless they're an exceptional person, that's probably going to spill over into the, the workplace. It'll be, even if you're doing fine at work, that personal anger will spill into the workplace. Because people are really bad at compartmentalizing stuff. Also, of course, can be used in politics. If you get people angry about like one thing, you can get them angry about unrelated things. Just get the anger, you know, this, what a person will typically do is get people angry at one thing and then just start bringing in other things, start mentioning them so people get angry about, about that. Because anger is like a virus. So the structure of the argument from outrage or appeal to anger is basically you do something to cause someone to feel angry. Then what you do is you use that to get them to accept the claim. But again, you wouldn't just say to someone, hey, be angry, believe my claim. 
you'd want to manipulate them. Like in the case, you know, like Dave was doing to Sam, you'd want to manipulate him. If he just said, hey, be angry at Sally, you know, don't vote for her, that's not going to work. But if he spins that tail, he's probably going to be able to win Sam over. Even though, of course, logically, there's no connection. So you want to know your target. What will make them angry? What do they dislike? If it's on a personal level, you want to know things about them personally. What, are they, what makes them mad? What sort of grievances and grudges do they have? On a large scale, politically, you'd want to know people's things they, they hate. You know, are people angry about the economy? Are people angry about the border? Are people angry about losing their privilege? And then bring those up. And then people will just get angry and they'll accept the, the claims. Um, Donald Trump, our president, is really good at this. He'll get people riled up and get them to accept all sorts of claims. And it's very, very effective. Now, an another variation of the appeal to anger is the classic scapegoating. And scapegoating goes back to, supposedly, it goes back to a sort of ritual practice. And the idea would be this. A village would take, like, a goat, literally, an actual goat, and they would sort of symbolically or ceremonially place all of the sins of the town, the village, all the bad stuff on the goat, and then drive it out of town. And sort of symbolically or ritually, it gets it, the goat is blamed, and it, they get rid of all of those sins. Now, today, of course, it doesn't involve getting a goat and doing that. What it involves is the following. Scapegoating is to place upon a group or an individual responsibilities for well, typically like all of the problems, or at least many of the problems, that they are not responsible for. Now, if you're, if you're blaming those responsible for the problems, that wouldn't be scapegoating. So if someone like really did all this bad stuff, and you say, hey, they did all this bad stuff, that would not be a scapegoating or a witch hunt. That would be actual you know, legitimate blaming. But scapegoating occurs when again a group is blamed for all these problems that they are not to blame for. So it involves an element of, of deceit and lie. Now this is a very powerful technique politically. So for example, in the United States, scapegoating has been used throughout history. So if we have a problem you know, that's occurring, a group will be picked to be blamed for. Probably the most extreme example of this, historically, it was, of course, um, Nazi Germany. You know, Germany was having problems with the economy, so they resorted to anti-Semitism, leading, of course, to the Holocaust. And today, we're not at the Holocaust stage yet, but we see similar thinking. We see the white nationalists blaming um, you know, migrants. We see them bringing up the old anti-Semitism. And so when people claim that there's problems because of you know, migrants or minorities or you know, Jews, etc., or women, there's just classic scapegoating. And the idea basically is be angry about these people, therefore it's true they're responsible. So you know, typically the next day is doing bad stuff. So scapegoating is very useful because people they want to have kind of a simple focus for their, their problems and they want this cause of their problem to be somebody other than them. So people usually don't want to hear the problem is like <laughs> them. <laughs> they want to hear the problem is someone else, preferably someone different. Now scapegoating can also occur not just with blaming like particular people, it can also occur with blaming policies, etc. For example, take the uh, debate over coal. Now the claim was, kind of scapegoating was, is the reason why coal was in trouble and coal miners were in trouble was because of all the regulations. That's why, you know, that's why there's trouble. But that's mere scapegoating because the reason why coal wasn't doing well was because of natural gas. Natural gas is much cheaper, uh, cleaner, it's easier to, to get. In fact, it's so common when you see the wells like just burning off stuff, it, that's natural gas. There's just so much of it. And so to blame regulation for the problems of the coal would be scapegoating. The real problem is that natural gas, just way cheaper. Another example, 
when people blame uh, migrants for taking away manufacturing jobs, you're like, oh, those Mexicans are stealing all our jobs. Well, that's actually scapegoating because, well, why aren't there manufacturing jobs here? Do the Mexicans steal our jobs? No, most of the stuff was shipped overseas by American companies, conscious choice, and also robots. <laughs> robots, it's true, robots are stealing our, our jobs. So when people blame you know, Mexicans or migrants for job, jobs going away, no, I mean, true, there are some cases, particular cases where migrants did take people's jobs, but the main reason for the economy being the way it is is automation overseas, you know, shipping jobs overseas, and changing the economy. Now, the reason why scapegoating is bad is because, of course, it's untrue. So if we're trying to solve a problem and we're just scapegoating, we're never going to fix the, the problem. So if our economy is, you know, if people are having trouble getting good jobs and we attack something that's not the cause, we're never going to solve the problem. Okay, so on the side of evil, here's how you use argument from Oak Ridge. Again, you have to know what makes your target angry. On an individual level, again, know stuff about who, who annoys them, what do they dislike. If you're working on a political scale, you need to know broad things. What are the things that your target audience hates? And then bring them up to make people angry. And then put forth your claim, as simple as that. You get people angry, they'll accept claims that have no connection to what they're supposedly angry about, weirdly enough. Scapegoat, again, really useful. If you want to gain power by blaming a particular group and getting people angry, find groups that people don't like, marginalized groups, people they dislike, and then blame them for everything, and then people will, will accept that. And then they'll vote you into, into office and give you power. Super useful. So on the side of good, how do you defend against this? Well, as I mentioned, kind of the logical defense is this is to look at it and say, what are they actually paying me? And if you look at it and say, well, they're just saying, be angry, believe this. And looking at it that way, you'd see there's no connection. They're offering you not real money, they're offering you counterfeit money, so you shouldn't buy it. Now the challenge, of course, is not getting caught up in the emotion, which can be difficult, because that's basically a matter of emotion. And our good day friend Aristotle had a lot of advice about that. That's a matter of beyond <coughs> critical thinking. So kind of the general defense is, would be this. Okay, this is aimed at making me feel angry, but do I have a justification? For my anger, or is it just anger except the claim with no connection? And again, this can be tough if people are really riled up and full of you know, anger, or full of scapegoating, then it can be hard to get them to, to accept that. Like, you probably couldn't stand up at a rally and say, hey, consider this, perhaps this is just scapegoating, perhaps they really aren't to blame for our problems. That's not gonna end well, typically. But, you know, reflecting on what's being offered is a way to see if it's good logic or not. Now, as I mentioned, there are some cases that look like bad logic, but are not. And in the case of the um, emotion of anger, there can be such cases. And here's how. Now, the reason why this is a fallacy is not because of the anger part. It's because all that's given is, here's anger, except claim, which obviously doesn't logically follow. Now, you can have cases, and this is an important thing to keep in mind, where you do actually have evidence, real evidence, that does make you angry. So if you actually have, say, a good reason or evidence, and there is a conclusion that actually follows from it, the mere fact that you get angry, you feel anger towards you know, this information, this evidence, this occurrence, doesn't disqualify. So the fact that something makes you angry doesn't mean that the fallacy has occurred. So you can't say, hmm, I feel angry about this, Therefore, this is a fallacy, because how you feel about it doesn't prove it one way or another. For example, suppose um, you're in an organization, 
and you find out the treasurer organization has stolen, you know, embezzled funds, stolen money from your organization. And they are running to be the treasurer again. Now, if you say, this person stole money for us, we should definitely not make them our treasurer again. Now, would you be angry that someone was stealing from you? Yeah. But does that make it a fallacy? No, because you're not saying angry, therefore this is true. You're saying, you know, they stole from us. Treasurer shouldn't steal. They shouldn't be our treasurer. And you probably feel angry about the stealing part, but the anger is not relevant. Because even if you take away the anger, you've got a good reason. So it's also important to ask, okay, I feel angry about this, but is there actually a good reason? If the answer is yes, that doesn't disqualify it as being evidence. So the mere fact that something may, may make you mad doesn't make it a thousand. So how do you tell that? Well, basically the idea is, if all they've got is just anger, and if you take away the anger, there's no reasons, fallacy. If something makes you mad, but if you take away the anger, you still have got a logical reason, then not a, not a fallacy. And sometimes it can be hard to, to sort that out, but that's the basic test. Okay, so that's the appeal to anger argument from outrage. Before moving on from anger, anything about anger that needs more Now, fear, also a very powerful emotion. And of course, you can blend these together. There's no requirement that you only use you know, one fallacy at a time. You can smush together fear and anger. Now, this fallacy is called, by the authors in the book, scare tactics, also sometimes called appeal to, appeal to fear. And again, there's no Bureau of International Standards of Fallacy Naming. So if you look at different, different logical books, different websites, etc., you'll see different names for the same fallacy. So this one, similar deal. The idea is, feel this emotion, accept this claim. In this case, the emotion is, of course, fear. Now, the crudest version of this, sometimes called the ad vacuum, which is basically the uh, appeal to force, which is just simply a threat, where someone just says, if you know what's good for you, you believe this. Or just, a, just an unveiled threat, just like, believe this or you're, you know, you're fired or, or you killed or something. And of course, that is bad logic. Just because someone threatens people with death or harm, it doesn't prove a claim is true. Which points to two types of reasons. Now, when it comes to reasons, there is the logical version of reasons, which we saw. And a logical reason means that, taken from an objective perspective, like God's view, this would give you a logical reason to accept the claim. That is to say, it provides proof. That evidence supports the conclusion. Now, we also, of course, have prudential or practical reasons. And these are not a matter of providing logical proof. It's a matter of you have a practical motivation, an incentive to accept it or do something. And they're very different things, because they can be something that logically there's no connection, but for a prudential or pragmatic way, you might want to do it to illustrate. Suppose someone comes bursting through the doors, dressed as Elvis, carrying an AK-47, and they point at us and say, do you believe that the king is going to be at the moon to bring forth you know, the great music of Elvis. And of course, we're going to say, we believe, because <laughs> we do not wish to be shot over something like Elvis. But once a person has been subdued, should we expect to be going to the moon to see Elvis? Oh, no. So we get a very practical reason to, to go along to avoid being shot, but no logical reason to believe the claim. So scare tactics can give people practical reasons to accept something or do something. So if someone is frightened or threatened, you know, or compelled, 
they may have a very practical reason to go along to avoid being burned. But logically, of course, that proves nothing. That's just being prudential, being practical. Now, there are other scare tactics that are more, more subtle. Or you know, not like direct threats. One example is not to threaten someone like what bad things you're going to do to them, but try to scare them by saying someone else will do bad things to them if they don't accept your claim. And, and not in the sense of, you know, Guido will, will kill you if you don't believe my claim, or Sally will kill you if you don't believe my claim. It's that believe my claim or these other people will be doing bad stuff. Again, the commonly used in politics. So, for example, we got to build the wall because yeah, people are going to come here to kill us, bring it, bring it in disease, steal our jobs, give us disease, and murder us. And that's essentially scare tactics. The idea is basically be afraid of you know migrants. Therefore, the wall must be built. But of course, logically, be afraid of migrants. The wall is a good idea, doesn't, doesn't follow. Because it's just scare tactics. Be afraid, therefore the claim is true. Now there can also be cases that are more, much more subtle, that don't seem to involve like a clear threat, but do involve a, you know, a subtle threat. I'll give two examples. Years ago when I was going to buy um, a truck, I was going to various uh, car dealerships in Tallahassee, looking at the various trucks. And I went to uh, Toyota, and I was looking at the Tacoma. And so, you know, I took it for a test drive, and I liked it. And I said, well, I'm you know, talking to the salesperson. Of course, they wanted me to buy it instantly. And I said, well, I'm going to go look at a couple other ones, and, you know, just, just to be sure. And he said to me, if you leave now, I can't guarantee that there'll be one left when you come back. And I looked at the sea of Tacomas. <laughs> as far as I could see, there were Tacomas. And I said, I'll take my chances. And so I went and, you know, went and looked at a couple other, other trucks. And I did come back and buy the Tacoma, but not because of the scare tent. Because what he was saying is, you must buy this because if you don't, there won't be any left. Which are just scare tactics. And the reason why I bought it was not because I was scared, but because I liked it the, the best. And I still, it was a good choice, still have it. 18 years later, my truck can, can vote. It's going to college next year. Very proud of it. <laughs> college is so expensive, though, especially for trucks. Other example, advertising often relies on kind of subtle scare tactics. Uh, or not so subtle. A not so subtle one would be, have you seen the ads for security systems? What they'll do is they'll show, like, you know, some, usually a mother or a child from Maximum Fear Effect, and they're in a really nice neighborhood, and someone, you know, some scruffy person comes in, it kicks the door. But fortunately, they have a you know, security system and they're saved. Otherwise, it would be terrible. Now, the fact that there are dangers give you a reason to be cautious, but that commercial doesn't prove that you should buy their security system. Because what it's saying is, here's a scary commercial showing a scary person doing scary stuff, therefore you must buy our security system. And of course, that doesn't doesn't follow. More subtle example, the um, various personal care products like um, deodorant, um, toothpaste, you know, shampoo, they all often make subtle use of scare tactics. For example, uh, they'll, one, was, one example is they'll show two people are on a date, they're going back to you know, the woman's apartment, and she looks and sees he's got, he's got dandruff. And he's like, can I come in for some coffee? She's like, no coffee for you. And so he has to go home, make his own coffee. And then they replay it again. This time, you know, he's used the head and shoulders. And he's like, can I come in for some coffee? She's like, you bet. And they go in and have some coffee. So I guess it's a coffee commercial, I would assume. And so the idea there is a scare tactic. Don't use our shampoo or you'll be alone Sad and, and it's you know, scare tactic, essentially. So politics, advertising, etc. relies heavily on scare tactics. As a final illustration, <coughs> when the, um, oh, uh, another example torn from today's politics, uh, you, you might have heard of the, the Democrats have this plan for a Green New Deal. And 
if you listen to Fox and the President, that means that they're, they're claiming that they're going to take away uh, all planes, all cows, uh, military, everything. And in a way, that's the scare tactics. You know, you agree with the Democrats and you'll never have a hamburger, you'll never fly, fly again. And so it's both hyperbole and scare tactics. Now, what about cases that may look like scare tactics, but are not? Well, one case that looks like scare tactics, but isn't, is the case of a warning. Because the whole point of a warning is to inform you of something dangerous, potentially scary, and that you should avoid that. Now, in this case, it wouldn't be a fallacy because what's being presented is not, be scared, this is true. It's, here's something you should be concerned about, which you may be scared about, but you should avoid it if you don't want that. For example, suppose someone says, suppose you're walking along and you see like a snake and you go, oh, look at the, the snake. And someone says, uh, don't touch that, it looks harmless, but it's the most poisonous snake in North America. Now in that case, it wouldn't be scare tactics because you have a good reason, unless you're looking to die, to not touch the snake. Or another example, if, somebody, if somebody's doing electrical work and someone says, hey, don't, don't touch any wires yet, I don't know if power's really off. I threw the breaker, but some of these old houses, that can, that's a shut off all the power. In that case, it wouldn't be scare tactics. Because unless, again, the person wants to be electrocuted, they have a good reason not to touch the wire. So the person is not, here's something scary, believe my claim, it's, here's something dangerous. If you don't feel like dying, you may want to avoid that. Now, there are also cases where there can be things that are scary that still also give us reasons. For example, if it is true that something does present a clear danger, for example, let's take the Green Deal. Suppose it is true that the Democrats plan, you look at their plan, it says, you know, step one, take away the planes. Step two, take away the cows. Step three, take away the hamburgers. In that case, it wouldn't be scare tactics because that would be all would be in a way true. And if you didn't want to lose that stuff, you'd have good reason not to support that plan. So if there is something that is actually terrible, and the terribleness gives you a reason to not want it, that wouldn't be scare tactics. That would be good logic. So there can be things that are scary that still give you reasons. So when looking at whether it's scare tactics or not, the key question to ask is, am I being given reasons that just happen to maybe scare me for a claim, or is it just, is the person just trying to scare me into accepting a claim? So, if there are reasons that may happen to be scary for the claim, not a fallacy. If it's just all that's being offered is fear and scary, scary stuff to accept the claim, then it'd be the fallacy. And sometimes it can be hard to tell because people will like buy a lot. So you kind of have to ask, you know, is this stuff actually true and does it connect to the issue? So on the side of evil, there's not easy. Again, know your audience. Know what frightens them. Also, this can tie into anger. So, for example, when people appeal to racism, they're appealing to anger, but they're also appealing to fear. Similarly with like sexism, appealing to anger and also fear. And so you need to know what your audience fears. And then you bring up that fear and get them to accept the claim you want to accept, whatever it is you're trying to get them to accept. Build that wall to reject, you know, climate change to do whatever, and it's extremely effective. Now, again, the main thing is you've got to know the fears, you know, to appeal to, to get them to accept it. And there's also the concern of going like possibly too far, like if it becomes too absurd, it goes from being scary to just being crazy. But you know, again, you got to know your audience. Some audiences will accept anything, no matter even if it seems totally. Same. Defense is to say, well, am I being given, given something that's actual evidence that I have to be scared of for my claim, or is the, is the person just offering something scary, just an empty scariness? If the answer is there's no evidence there, then it's the fallacy. Doesn't mean the claim is not true, could be true, but the argument gives you no reason to, to accept it. 
Before pressing on to more emotions, anything about fear that needs more fear stuff. The next argument is the argument from pity. Known as appeal to pity, uh, also known in Latin as ad misericordium. The basic idea here is it's all about the pity. Now, if you're feeling pity, what do you feel? You feel sad for someone else. You feel their pain, as Bill Clinton would say. Now, as always, the emotion itself is not a fallacy. So anger is not a fallacy. Fear is not a fallacy. Pity is not a fallacy. Where it becomes a fallacy is this. If someone tries to create the emotion of pity, you know, compassion, etc., in you, and offer no reasons for their claim, but want you to accept the claim because of that feeling of pity, they're doing appeal to pity. And just like the appeal to anger and, and scare tactics and appeal to pity tend to be offensive fallacies. Typically, they have be used against someone else because you typically like wouldn't use scare tactics on yourself, although I guess you could reinforce it. Uh, but again, typically these are offensive fallacies. So how would this be used? Well, as I mentioned, the idea is basically you need to know your target audience. What would make what would invoke the greatest pity in them, have the greatest emotional effect? And then just get them to feel that and then work the claim in. Now again, if you just say to someone, pity me, accept my claim, no one would fall for that. So what you have to do is you have to manipulate them. You have to make them feel pity and then kind of slide the claim in there so that they accept it. And this can be really useful. I'll give an example of this. Um, the first year of teaching, uh, somebody had missed like a bunch of classes. And I, I had recently had just had to miss a class because uh, my grad school roommate had died of non Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so I told the class I had to go to his funeral. And so the student comes in, and she's missed a bunch of classes. You know, she, she, didn't, have any excuse, she didn't have excuses. And she told me, she said, I have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You know, I'm in really rough shape. I haven't been able to get my excuses from my doctor. And of course, so I said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. You know, yeah, you can do all the makeups. You know, I'll do whatever, whatever I can do to help you get through this semester. And so then she goes to Dr. Idol. And Dr. Idol had been in an accident, bad car accident. And she told him he was missing his classes because she was in a really terrible car accident. And that, you know, he, she'd never excuse this, etc. You know, could she do this? And she didn't realize that uh, I happened to be like within hearing range of this because his office was just, just down the hall. I'm not sure how she didn't know. And so I was like, hmm. And do you, it, it worked because I, I mean, like I said, my friend had just died. And I literally just buried, buried my grad school you know, roommate. And someone saying they've got non Hodgkin's lymphoma worked until, of course, I heard that. And so, appeal to pity. I mean, she had no reason, because it was all untrue, but very effective. So, lesson one, know your audience. Lesson two, always make sure the story is, is straight. Always use the same story. But aside from that slight flaw of using different stories in every case, it would have been, would have been perfect. So, if you ever wonder why progressives are skeptical, we all, we all have stories like that. <laughs> like that. I mean, I don't doubt people now. Like that's, but I always ask people for the, like, the actual paper documents because of that. And I thought, oh my god, if someone can lie about that, people can lie about anything. And in, in that case, I was a student learning from, learning from her that people are terrible. <laughs> so that's the technique. Another example, less horrible example. Uh, in this very room, uh, the first year I was teaching as well, during uh, my ecstatics class, someone came through, these doors used to open from the outside, and someone came through and the whole class kind of looked at them, the kind of look you give to someone like, we've never seen this person before, why, why are they here? And he walks past the desk and flips a folded piece of paper on the desk and just walks out. And I pick up the paper and open it up, and I, I you know, say to the class, say, well, and they're all you know, taking fun of us. And uh, this student has said that he's never been to class, never done any work, but he wants to, me to give him an A because if he didn't, his parents would be really sad, he's got a sweet job lined up and he wouldn't be able to, to get that sweet job. What do you think? And they're like, no, we had to put up with the, all your stuff all semester. No way to do that. I did respect the fact that he asked for an A. It wasn't like you know, the Mercy D or the Mercy C. It was full on the A. And I had to respect that level of audacity. 
I assume he's like probably a CEO somewhere <laughs> at this point. And it's a straight up appeal to pity. You know, the fact that you know his parents would be very sad if he doesn't get the grade and he's got a sweet job lined up. Uh, true, you know, I felt bad for him, but of course it doesn't prove that he deserves an end. <clears throat> so on the side of evil, the technique's pretty straightforward. You know your audience, and then you appeal to the appeal to their pity and get them to accept accept a claim. And again, pro tips, make sure the story is, you know, keep the story straight. And of course it's better if it's true, but of course it doesn't have to be because it's just a, a fallacy. So how do you defend against this? Well, the defense is not to become heartless and feel nothing. The defense is basically to ask, you know, from a logical standpoint, is there a connection between what they're claiming, assuming it's true, and the actual claim? Does the thing that invokes pity give me a reason to accept their claim? Like in the case of the person, you know, saying, I got a sweet job lined up, my parents will be sad. Well, probably should show up to class, you know, once in a while, that'll really work. And so in that case, there's no connection. Now, there are cases where there are things that can make you feel pity that do actually give you a good reason. For example, back in the days before Blackboard, when tests were all done on paper, if someone came, you know, hobbling into class, the you know, a week after the exam on crutches with a leg in a cast and with an excuse and said, you know, I, I got hit by a hit by a car, but you know, on the day of the test my leg was broken, I wasn't able to do it, here's my excuse, I deserve makeup. Well in that case that would be not a fallacy. I would certainly feel pity for someone who's been hit by by a vehicle and has a broken leg, but the pity is irrelevant. The fact that they were injured originally just the exam provides support for that. So the mere fact that something can invoke pity doesn't mean that it's automatically a fallacy. Because there can be good reasons that make us feel, for someone, feel pity, that do support the claim. Now there are also cases where it's not an appeal to pity because there's no argument. For example, suppose um, there's a family and their daughter has, you know, one of her friends over, and the parents, you know, notice that the their daughter's friend looks a little thin, and they find out that the, their daughter's friend's parents have lost their job, and you know, struggling, and they said, oh, you know, we should we should invite Sally over for dinner, you know, more often. In that case, they're acting from pity, but it's not really it's not an argument. They're just being nice. So being compassionate and nice isn't this fallacy because it's not. Here's something to make you feel pity, here's a claim is true, it's just, I feel compassion for someone, I'm doing something nuts. And that would not be a fallacy, in fact, it's not even an argument. So things to watch for are, is the thing that creates pity still a reason, like the broken leg, or is it not an argument at all, where it's just, you know, this person seems to be in need, I'm gonna help them. Now as a final point, we can of course decide to act on the claiming even if we know better. So for example, if um, suppose you're in a company and you're in charge of bonuses and it's supposed to be given out based on merit. And someone comes in and you find out that you know their their husband has cancer, their you know their mother has Alzheimer's and they're super struggling and they, they really need that money. And even though they don't really merit it, Logically, their fate, their situation doesn't give you a logical reason to accept the claim and deserve it, but you could decide to give it to them, you know, as a matter of compassion. And that wouldn't be a fallacy because you're just, you're acting on, you know, your feeling. You're not saying, you know, pity, therefore this claim is true. You're just saying, God, this person's in terrible dire straits. I know this really should go as a merit, but this person, they, they totally need that. So we'll help them out. So being nice need not be a fallacy. Before moving to envy, anything about pity? It needs more pity. Um, envy. Or appeal to envy. Now, the book's version of fallacy goes like this. The idea is, 
It's kind of the sour grapes fallacy. The story of the sour grapes is, of course, from Aesop's fable you know, about the animals and stuff. And this, in the story, there's a fox crawling along. It looks up and sees some grapes up there. It's like trying to jump up to them and get them, but it can't reach them. And of course, the fox says, mm, I bet they're sour anyways. Because the idea is if it can't have it, then there must be something wrong with it. Now, in the argument from envy, at least the book's version, the idea is, is when someone infers from their envy of somebody that something is, you know, something negative about them. So the idea is basically, I feel envy towards these people, therefore there must be something you know, wrong or bad about them. Kind of like, you know, like with some of the sour grapes. The fox can't get the grape, so it's like, I bet they're terrible. For example, one thing that people often do, well, wait, it's, it's kind of a weird paradox thing. On one hand, people tend to think that people who are celebrities and wealthy must be really happy. On the other hand, they also kind of think they must also be really miserable or, or messed up. So people tend to think like if you have some celebrity couples, we generally think that they're just together because of their images. Uh, you know, they don't, really, they don't really care for each other, and it's all going to be a disaster. Or we think that if people are really rich, they must actually be kind of bad people, and they must secretly be unhappy. But does envy prove that? Do we know for sure that all rich people are unhappy? No, they're probably no more unhappy than the rest of us. Probably less so, because they have money. Similarly, like celebrities, you know, the people are envious of them and think all kinds of bad things, it doesn't, doesn't follow. Now, another variation on this, which is not in the book, is when someone does the following bad reasoning. What someone will do is essentially an accusation of envy. And what a person will do is if someone's critical of something, they'll say, and it's a version of the, uh, we'll see this in the future of the ad hominem, they'll say that they're just envious, therefore they're wrong. For example, um, if someone criticizes, say, the economic distribution of our country, and they say, you know, there shouldn't be as many billionaires, they should, they should tax them more, you know, and, and tax them more and, and use that money to benefit people who aren't billionaires. What someone will, will typically do is say, oh, they're just envious of billionaires, therefore they're wrong. Now, the person could be wrong that taxing billionaires is a good idea. They could be wrong about that. But just saying that they're envious doesn't prove they're wrong. But it's a very common tactic. If you, when, again, whenever people criticize the economic system about it being unfair or unjust, the common response is, at least from certain quarters, is they're just jealous. They're just Envious. It's a form of an ad hominem with a particular focus on envy. But of course, even if the person is envious, if they secretly really want to be a billionaire, doesn't prove their claim is wrong. Because the claim stands or falls on its own, not on how they actually, actually feel. Now, this version, the first version of the uh, argument or appeal to envy is typically self-inflicted. Again, like the sour grapes case, where a person tells them themselves, oh, I bet they're miserable, you know, someone they envy. And it's typically self-inflicted to make someone feel, feel better. This other version is an attack or offensive one. It's used against other people. So if someone is critical of you know, the economic system, or someone is critical of you know, how you know, school money is distributed, what people will apply is, well, they're just jealous. But again, even if they are jealous, it doesn't follow their wrong. So as always, the defense here is to say, okay, I feel envious, but is this actually true? Or in the case of this one, perhaps those people are, <laughs> are envious, but is, the, are, is there actually evidence there? Is the, their claim true? Next time, we'll pick up looking at the um, emotion of pride and flattery, looking at apple policy, then on a guilt trip and wishful thinking. So have a good rest of the week, and I'll see you on.
the Tuesday for more galaxies. Mm -hmm.